This is JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals, and JSA Radio, your voice for tech and telecom on iHeart Radio. I'm Jamie Scott of Pattaya, and on behalf of my team here at JSA, welcome to our monthly virtual CEO roundtable. These virtual roundtables lead us up to our on-site CEO roundtables at our C-level networking event, the Telecom Exchange. Next one up, June 20th in Hoboken, New Jersey at the W Hotel. And later in the year, Telecom Exchange LA, November 7th, Beverly Hills. More info for both events at thetelecomexchange.com. So let's get started. We are gathered here today to talk about the state of dark fiber. And we have an executive lineup for you from three absolutely innovative companies, Clarion, Zeo, and Zen5. And in true roundtable format, our live viewers can now type in their questions in the question box and time permitting, we will pose your questions to our speakers. And I'm very proud to introduce today our star guest moderator, leading journalist and editor, particularly on dark and lit fiber news, Mr. Sean Buckley, who head up the editorial at Fierce Telecom, part of Fierce Markets for the past nine years. Sean, it's an honor to have you and thank you so much for the many contributions and coverage in our industry's news. Great. Uh, let me introduce today's speakers. Like Jamie just said, we have a great lineup here of uh, some real great experts, starting with Cliff Kane, the co-CEO of Clarion, Mark Surjak, a long industry veteran who's the vice president of Doc Fiber Services at Zao. Finally, Ray Lachance, president and chief executive officer of ZenFi. Well, I'll just get right into it uh, with some of the questions here. Um, my first question is, the notion of Doc Fiber is hardly new, as we all know. Well, what's different about the opportunity now versus 20 years ago when the internet began to emerge? Uh, Mark, we'll start with you. What, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I lived through the first wave of DSL deployment when I was in my early days at GTE, and it was literally, as we all know, back in the 2000 mark, the Wild West. Everyone wanted an ISP, a C-Luck, or Colo, and it was all great and good until the market crashed and suddenly no one could get more materials. I mean, at that time, Fiverr was buried just to bury it. They were more focused on returns and doing an IPO than they were actually about connecting real customers. I think really now is what we're seeing today is dark fiber will be deployed very strategically to support the bandwidth growth, uh, data center activity, and also content providers will be deployed very methodically. And I think really going forward, we'll see carriers in their, in their best interest deploying that methodically, not over promise, because the marketplace really has a, a long memory about who will be successful to an opening. Cliff, how about you? I would agree with everything that's said, and I would add that um, uh, 20 years ago, uh, dark fiber and putting dark fiber was uh, a, a bit more specialized or a lot more specialized. I, I'd say from the, my perspective, the business end is that it's uh, commoditized greatly. Uh, it's omnipresent. Uh, there's a lot of fiber out there. Um, there's a lot more that's going to be needed. So that's why we're, we're back in, in this in the fiber game. But the, I can remember, um, you know, maybe even a little bit before 20 years ago when, when uh, you had, uh, we were doing fiber jobs, the guys that would come to Splice and were wearing uh, long white lab coats. And, uh, you know, it was, they were splicing one fiber at a time. It was just a, a whole different game and, and everything was so expensive. And, you know, it's the, the, uh, the skill sets to, to install dark fiber is now more widespread and easily to more easy to be found and the, the market's commoditized. Great, Ray, how about you? Sure, so uh, I'd like to characterize the evolution of the fiber industry that we're in now is we're in the, uh, genera the second generation or, or dark fiber two generation. I, I think the, the problems, all the problems, the easy problems have been solved, right? Enterprise connectivity and and uh, your residential connectivity uh, to, to in major metropolitan areas, you know, these sparse fiber networks have been built. The next, the, the next problem, so we have coverage everywhere, but we don't have capacity. And there's the, the next build that has to happen is we have to now look at those backhaul networks that have been built to date and now infill because in the end, at the end of the day, we need fiber any and everywhere. You need fiber at every rooftop, every floor of every office building, every street corner, throughout every major metropolitan city in, in the U.S., and then certainly have to densify in, in other markets. So that you know, while there is a lot of fiber, and Cliff's absolutely right, there's a ton of fiber in New York City. This doesn't go to the right places, exactly. and, and there's not enough of it. So there, there's a great opportunity to build 
a whole new infrastructure. I think we're right at the beginning of this densification wave, and it's dark, dark fiber two generation. Great. Okay. Um, this wouldn't be a discussion about dark fiber if we didn't talk about five G network wireless deployment. So where see dark fiber's role in 5g wireless network deployment cliff i'll start with you and then we'll we'll go around around the the world here yeah. sure uh front hall front hall front hall um <laughs> and, you know, densification uh is i think mostly going to happen uh between small cell DAS systems iot type uh aggregation points uh to front hall edge data centers and, and that's indeed what we're positioning for is clearion uh, that's why we've been acquiring data center uh, operations in the metro uh, to provide the, the, the hoteling function along with the, uh, the ability to design, build, uh, install, and maintain fiber. But and also on, on top of that, you know, the ability to do the backhaul uh, because our broader um, you know, core network uh, connects to all the, uh, the local data centers. Uh, so the access to uh, you know, the carriers and customers alike uh, can be provided to those edge data centers and then the front hall is what really needs to, to be built. So I think the, the major focus uh, of fiber construction uh, is, is going to be on the front hall side. So that's that's more localized, more neighborhood driven. So that's how I see it. Mark, how about you? You're at Zale, uh, certainly winning a lot of, you know, big dark fiber contracts. I think you you guys won, recent, won a few recently, actually, in some big cities, but what's your perspective? I didn't really think about 5G networks. I mean, it's going to be pivotal of the next wave of the Internet of Things. And you know, mm -hmm. we commonly call the unknown unknowns. What's the bandwidth we need demands for today? Where does that look like even two or three years from now? I think it's going nowhere except really explosively up. Uh, you know, and 5G also could potentially change the entire telecom landscape. Uh, acceleration of cord cutting as we get into more streaming. And really, to me, is a shift from lit service into wireless. So if you look at low speed lit services today, 5G is a potential replacement. And then what happens to the carriers? You know, the AT&Ts, the Verizons, the Frontiers are from Ethernet services today. What happens long term? Really, dark fiber is positioned very well to enable those the small cell networks we have to go through and build today. As carriers look to push out and extend and densify their networks to meet demand and backhaul that, there's really no other way to do that effectively except with, with dark fiber. And it really gives those carriers then the ability to go through and say, hey, I have a, a scalable network today that for the future I have growth built into it as we deploy it. Ray, how about you? Sure. Well, I certainly couldn't agree more with uh, uh, Cliff, Cliff and Mark on this. Look, the reality is what, what's 5G going to deliver or 6G or 7G or whatever it ends up? And that's going to be very high capacity, very high bandwidth, low latency connectivity for both mobile users and fixed wireless users. The key is it's going to be delivered wirelessly. And what do you need to, to build great wireless networks? You need great wired networks. And it's all about densification, right? So we, you can't solve the 5G problem with more spectrum because there's just not enough spectrum to be allocated. And so what we have to do is this, this uh, notion of spectral reuse, where we put antennas as close to the user as possible, use that same, those same frequencies in close, small cells that are adjacent to each other. And the best way to serve those small cells with capacity is to, is to use fiber networking. And so, uh, you know, we see, we see that as the major growth. The reason the industry is seeing a huge growth and an uptick in, in, for infrastructure builders, we're a communications infrastructure builder, uh, in, in the market, we focus on on this underlying um, connectivity primarily for the antennas. You know, we have we have uh, nearly 5,000 uh, street side antennas uh, under contract, nearly 2,000 built uh, to date in in just in New York City, and our our that's that's all on a new technology that that, uh, that Cliff had mentioned. He talked about front hall networking. Front hall network is a network that reaches out and touches antenna locations and brings you back to baseband and core baseband processing in the neighborhood. I like to characterize it as a network of neighborhood networks where there's a, there's a colo in the neighborhood, front hall out to the antenna, and you pick up the RF signal, you get back to the call, and then we go back to traditional networks. The, the legacy networks that have been built for the 20 years, past 20 years are great for that colo to, to core connectivity but they're not great for that antenna connectivity. So that, that's the new opportunity. 5G is driving the bulk of the opportunity in the space from my perspective, certainly in, in large urban markets like New York. Great, okay. Um, another question I have here is about the build it versus buy. Um, Verizon, as you all know, has tended to build it themselves approach, uh, but obviously they're gonna use, still use other suppliers like the three of you. 
Um, so how will decisions by them and other wireless operators affect the overall dark fiber market, especially as we look at 5G? Uh, Mark, we'll start with you. Yeah. I mean, there's been obviously a lot in the marketplace about Verizon wanting to go it alone, but in a lot of ways, going alone can be awful lonely in the sense that you know, Verizon is a large provider with deep pockets and they have the time to do it, but to get the scale they need and the speed to deploy that, I really think that Verizon at some point will look at it and say, hey, is it cheaper for me and faster for me to lease a network tomorrow morning from someone else or is it, or is it easier to go build it? I think in a lot of the markets, because of the pressure with AT&T rolling out 5G, we will see Verizon look to partner with other companies. And even look at just Ericsson today. Ericsson is a large scale provider for Verizon. You know, Ericsson also provides services for Sprint and for the other major carriers as well. So I think when you get down to the local market level, it's going to be a really interesting dynamic to see. You may have one contractor, Ericsson, running around and working for several companies and all with competing goals. So yeah, I really get this way. I think they will go alone as much as they can, but there's going to be a trade-off to that. Okay. Ray, how about you? Well, you know, it's interesting. We see this cycle happening all the time, and it certainly has happened with um, – you know, even with wireline in, in our market. And um, <clears throat> the reality is anybody that's serving this this uh, wireless market and folks on densification, yes, they have a backhaul network in place and that's certainly <clears throat> connecting all the CEOs together. They have a Fios network. The problem is the um, the, the the density isn't there to, to that in their fiber networks that have enough capacity and they don't have enough accessibility. So they have to build new networks too. And it, and when they start looking at build versus buy, they're going to have to, uh, you know, uh, consider the, you, you know, think on uh, regional pockets by regional pockets where it makes most sense in an ILAC territory where they, where they also have a big Verizon business pre presence like New York, it may make sense to do more on their own than less. But uh, I, I think it's a mix and I certainly see the, the, uh, the opportunities, the fiber leasing opportunities, even though they stated this goal quite a while ago, Verizon specifically, to self-perform, they're still leasing. And I'm, I'm seeing them lease all, you know, every single cycle we go through for full top leasing in New York City. So I think it's a little both. Okay, Cliff? Yeah, so specifically on Verizon, I, I think anyone who has a, uh, you know, a large uh, footprint like Verizon or AT&T, you know, they're going to they're going to uh, uh, provide for themselves where it makes the most sense. These guys have been doing network for a hundred years, and, and they un they understand the, the the build process. And you know, I mean, look at they they bought or committed to buy two billion dollars worth of fiber from Corning a year or so ago. They made a big stink out of, uh, of making that known to the world. So they're they're going to be be building quite a bit of fiber, I would assume. Uh, at least probably deploy all of that fiber that that they're getting from Corning. So you know they're they're smart guys. Uh, they've been doing this; it's in their DNA. Uh, so for they'll augment where they need to augment, and and they'll they'll lease where they need to lease. So I I don't I I don't know how um, it, it will all probably benefit from some of the leasing. I mean the the panelists uh, and and Clarion, uh, but at the end of the day, um, you know in telecom, no one can do it all. And you always have to touch a network, somebody else's network someplace, and, and that's why we work together. Very true. Um, so what are the challenges uh, you folks are facing today and tomorrow as you roll out new and existing dock fiber installations? Ray, I'll start with you. So, you know, clearly the, the challenges we have uh, in a market in a dense urban environment like New York City is, uh, is congestion, right? We're working in a system. That, is, that has a whole lot of cables and a whole lot of capacity, it just doesn't go to the right place. So we're, we're, we're overbuilding in a very congested environment. So I, that, one of our, that's the most significant challenge we have getting around. So that, what does that do that drives costs up? The other, the other challenge we have is we're also doing turnkey siting and small cell installation and commissioning. And we, we actually own the infrastructure, the whole heart of the entire heart infrastructure from antenna to shroud, all the way down, the carriers bring their own bring their own electronics. The the uh, the challenge there is siting, right? So you need to you need in this case for outdoor, you need you need pole top locations or street furniture locations to site the stuff. So that is clearly a uh, you know challenging in, in it creates a challenging environment. It's stuff that you have to work around. However, it gives us a great opportunity to add value. So the, the, while there may be hurdles. 
for everyone else, we, we think we've mastered uh, getting around these things. And, it, and it's a, uh, I think, a strategic opportunity because it is so challenging. And we can run, you know, we can stand between the municipality and the carriers and, and turnkey for the carriers and make it, make it easy for them. Great. Yeah, all those exciting issues. Uh, Cliff, how about you? I think, you know, uh, challenging wise, challenges uh, where I think the one of the broader, and, I, and I'm, we're in the same market as, as uh, Ray Lachance and Zenfi, and, and so we, we see uh, all the congestion challenges and siting challenges that, that he mentioned. But, you know, for us, we're also a carrier's carrier delivering access and transport services. So, uh, you know, the, the one of the challenges that, that kind of irks me the most is that there's this expectation that the, the these prices will be so incredibly cheap. <laughs> and and you just don't know when when you're you're be, being fed a line or when, when you know they, they say well your competitor is bidding on this for half your price and then you do the math and you, you just can't see it but it's that's what um, there's, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, of um, uh, you know, I was misunderstanding or in the market that. Um, you know that this, this, the pricing is just falling through the floor, but when you have a, an asset like fiber, there is a theoretical uh, 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 price limitation to that. It's not like uh, lit services where you can cons constantly, you know, add uh, add more capacity. So in dark fiber, it's physical infrastructure. It basically, you get down to a, a point where there's a, you know a, a baseline cost. So at some point. If you're getting below those costs in, in the marketplace, that that's that's certainly a challenge. But uh, my my biggest gripe is that uh, everyone has this this downward price pressure and expectation. Mark, how about you? What are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, look at this as more of an industry issue. Is really with the improved economy, building and construction is taking off in a lot of key markets across the country. You've got local localities upgrading infrastructure, sewers, water, roads. Uh, if Congress could ever agree on anything, they may actually have an infrastructure bill that gets passed sometime in the next uh, couple of years. But the real question is, can localities and cities keep up with permitting and engineering? Uh, in some markets, I hear markets in Atlanta, for example, I mean, it may take you six months to get a permit. So really, you know, then you get down to the small cell deployment as well, approval of poles and attachments, hitting the carriers. All of these things must go through the same groups that are approving permits for office buildings, or approving permits for roads. So it's really all these different points are all emerging at the same time. I mean, you've got building access agreements and easements. So really, the carriers and the providers must be very aggressively engaged with the localities, making sure the relationships are very strong and making sure that process does not get in the way. And conversely, we're also seeing, and this probably is across the country as well, is the localities know how important small cells are to the carriers. They're becoming much more savvy in what their asks are back to those carriers and what they want to see from themselves as well. So really, it's you know, going forward, providers must consider all these aspects from permitting and engineering times all the way through build, how long will it take to get the network put in place? Great, okay. Um, another kind of question here is, um, what, are the uh, what is the advantage of using dark fiber over lit fiber? Does it depend on the networking situation or customer need? Uh, Cliff, I'll start with you and then go around. Yeah, I, I think it's a use case dependent uh, question to be asked. It's uh, you know that involves not only the you know what the use is, but the economics uh, when you dive deeper into a use case. So um, you know I, I think when we there's a threshold that that's you know that's been a moving uh, moving along uh, over the years where you know, now it's probably in maybe 10 gig or even 100 gig in some places uh, you know on, on the uh, on the core networks between the data centers where you may consider uh, you know, uh, going to a lit versus a dark. So that, that's the economics. Uh, and then uh, on the enterprise side, going out to uh, the buildings, uh, enterprise buildings and the commercial building, uh, which is, you know, that we don't do residential. So I think that uh, really depends on, on what the customer wants in that building. So that's, that's that part of it. In, insofar as front hall, um, you know, what, what I, you know, I think all the front hall is going to be dark fiber back to the edge data center, uh, but it'll be lit from from the edge data center into the core. Uh, so we're you know we're prepared to do uh, both of those. Uh, so I, I think it's really uh, a question that really depends on the use case. Okay, Ray, how about you? What are you seeing? Well, that that's an interesting question, and we've seen it. We've seen a cycle here, right? 
in the early 2000s, there, you, you know, everyone was stuck with list services from the carriers because because it wasn't dark, uh, pervasive dark fiber availability, and and frankly, enterprises didn't know how to light it themselves and were troubled with it. Then, then as we moved on, we moved to an environment where there became pervasive dark fiber, and and there was a lot of optical gear started started ending up in enterprise hands, and and certainly Ethernet speeds increased. And a lot of companies decided they wanted the security, the pri you know, the privacy, the virtually unlimited bandwidth, and the and the total control of the network. So they started taking down dark fiber and lighting it themselves. Then we started, you know, as we moved it, you know, closer to now, we've seen a shift in the enterprises where it's there, because of software-defined networking and and the ability to dial up your bandwidth really easy with carriers that that provide a. Uh, a, a you know, a more robust set of lit services that gives you a lot more of those private network feel, feeling that you used to have uh, when you did it yourself. I think we're seeing a lot of deals go to lit services. However, when we move over to this environment, like Cliff mentioned, front hall, front hall technologies, when they're a true front hall uh, connection where it's baseband processing and uh, separated from an antenna and RF uh, 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 end, end point, uh, the front hall technologies like Cipri are are really not meant to be lit in, 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 on switch, in, in switched environments. But when you do small cells with Ethernet interfaces, uh, some of the mobiles will ask for dark fiber because they wanted that it the dedicated control and the option to do uh, you know uh, uh, you know these these other front hall technologies. And and then some of the carriers will ask for Ethernet because they're used to bringing a one gig Ethernet to a macro site. And uh, lighting up, well, small cell has a has a 100 meg to a 1 gig interface in them. Typically, it's a digital interface. And a lit service works there. So we've seen both, and we've seen the same carriers ask for both a lit or dark service uh, to, to a small cell location. Um, but, but again, we're seeing less enterprise demand for private networks built on dark fiber, and we're seeing a, we're, we're seeing a lot of mobile demand for dark fiber. Okay, Mark, how about you? Yeah, I agree with what uh, Ray and Cliff are saying about uh, the dark fiber use. I mean, really, dark fiber provides scalability and adaptability, and really, the end of carrier carry dependent speed upgrades, like you've seen in Ethernet services, which for 5G is critical. Uh, you know, but dark fiber traditionally has also required a much more savvy customer than other types of network services have. And I think on the wireless side, you know, they have the deep pockets. They also are savvy enough to understand how to run their own networks as content providers have. I think the real thing you start seeing now in the next the next probably two to three years is really the tier two and tier three enterprise customers that have stood back a little bit from dark fiber start seeing deployment and the network actually being pushed further out because of small cell. It ultimately will reduce the cost and, and drive more people to it. So I mean, these you know, lit, lit services will be with us for, for a considerable amount of time in the future, but obviously, you know, for the higher bandwidth demand, dark fiber will be the play. Great. Um, another question here for me, um, what will differentiate dark fiber players? Uh, will it be reach, fiber count, experience? Um, Ray, I'll start with you and then I'll go around the horn here. Yeah, so, so as I said, we're, we're in the second generation or dark fiber 2.0 generation. The differentiator now is the, the fiber network serving the traditional uh, large scale enterprise locations and large res residential locations and the the, uh, the hybrid uh, fiber networks for uh, cable that stuff is roughly in place the the, uh, the the new generation of builds are really focused on as as mark and cliff had said it's this front hall piece this this densification of your fiber network so higher capacity cables have to be laid along the same routes and many more routes that 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 uh that they then have been done in the past and they also have to be accessible everywhere. And I'll give you a great example. When I'm building up Fifth Avenue net right now or up Broadway in New York City, we're building a network that you can access at every single manhole we traverse, which is a very different architecture. Our front hall architecture is very different than the legacy networks that were, that were built to support sparse networking. And the analogy, you could look at the legacy networks as the backhaul networks and think of those as the highway system. And you think of the front hall network as the local rail system, and we interface those two together, and we 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 create a whole new, highly accessible, very high capacity fiber network. And when I say high capacity, we're running you know 1728 cables. We we pair these down. Our access cable 
it used to be a, a, a 48 fiber cable or 72. The minimum access cable we're putting in place in the streets to, to get off to serve small cells is 576 fibers. Wow. It's it's pretty big, and our and the and the those trunk cables are now you know they've grown up to uh, you know 34 56 cables are the next step that that we're seeing that will actually fit in ducts that we work in. So you, you know that's uh, that's certainly how we see it. Okay, um, Cliff, how about you? Um, so, you know, it, it's, uh, I think it's very, very, my response would be very similar to Ray's, uh, so it's very repetitive, but um, I, I think that's um, the, um, uh, that challenge of um, uh, getting out to the, uh, to the edge uh, is really what we're, we're looking at and how do you best serve that and, and, you know, basically the physical constraints of the, of logic, of uh, physics. In terms of where you place these uh, edge data centers to, to uh, you know, to serve that uh, front hall network and, and you know, basically connect to the rest of the world. Great, and Mark. Yeah, I mean, basically what uh, Ray and uh, Cliff are saying is right on. I mean, fiber providers right now, as you mentioned, fiber reach services and count. I mean, it's going to be a combination of all these things. I think the real successful players in the future for dark fiber will be those that can serve multiple market areas and have on net services to provide for customers. Uh, you have to provide you know, significant fiber footprint with routing options, uh, large and of course large fiber, and also indoor metro areas as well. Uh, experience is going to be critical. I think anybody who's in this game has to be in this game for a long period of time. You can't walk in and think you'll do dark fiber and suddenly step away from it. Uh, and it's really to provide, I think, both pure dark fiber as well as managed networks. Some customers want only dark fiber. Some customers say, I want dark fiber, but I want you to manage that network. So really offer you know, multiple types of services. Having that local presence, again, is very important, but also pricing. The ability to band deliver bandwidth on time, how will you do that, and the providers that can do that quickly and scalable for the end user customer will be successful. Great. Um, I think we've got time for a couple of audience and a few more questions that I'll throw out here. Um, one question I have is, do you see more consolidation of the broader dark fiber market, and will new players emerge? I mean, certainly... I mean, Zao was a new player at one point and <laughs> multiple acquisitions and, and so ZenFi and everyone here. But um, I, I guess I'll, st I'll start with Ray and kind of go along from there. I mean, do you guys see more consolidation and new players launching the uh, the status quo? <laughs> uh, that status yep. quo is, I guess. <laughs> anyway. So, so I, I, I see both happening. I certainly see the opportunity for new players to join the market today because the again the legacy players haven't built the network that needs to be built yet and so and and there are companies like Zenfi that are going to go out and front run this we've been talking about this since uh, 2012 13 we started the company in, in 2014 we knew another network had to be built so we went out and built started building front hall well before it was in the vogue to even talk about front hall well we think that can happen all over the country in major metropolitan areas and there's a great, uh, you know, uh, M&A opportunity too, because the legacy players, rather than building it all themselves, will look to look around the market and, and uh, acquire those complementary networks that are a perfect snap-in to to enable them to support this this mobile densification wave. And uh, you know, clearly, uh, we we just announced a, a, a merger with uh, Cross River Fiber out in New Jersey. And we're very excited because that's a great compliment to what we've been doing in the New York market. We want to bring our story for mobile densification infrastructure play to New Jersey across their network and leverage that. And it, it also gives us the opportunity to take our, our asset within the New York market, which is a very dense, very pervasive fiber network in all five boroughs, and create new products upon it. Uh, so the, when you have complementary companies like this, I think you'll see a lot of M&A happening. Um, to, to help solve this problem because ultimately the, the infrastructure players, the large tower companies um, are, are, are going to, they have the relationships in the mobile market, they're going to dominate that space, they're going to need the, 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 these other players as part of the portfolio. So I think there's a great opportunity for consolidation and new interest. Uh, Mark, I'll kick it back to you. Now Zao is up to, what did you say, 40, 40 acquisitions over the past 10? <laughs> 11 years, I've, I've lost track myself, but yeah. Well, what do you think? You know, after, after being in this business for 25 years, I think everyone can agree to that there are no surprises left. Every day something new happens, right. uh, especially when it comes to mergers and acquisitions. Every time we hear there's no more regional players left, new ones pop up because they're growing organically inside of marketplaces. 
But again, in this dark fiber marketplace, it's going to be scaled and it really drives business. So I think you're going to continue to see those going forward in the future. And Cliff, to you. Uh, so I've been in, in this game for a long time, and, and everybody's always asking when is consolidation going to stop. <laughs> it just never does. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's the one continuum of, of the uh, sector. I, I think we're all kind of, uh, you know, in in the uh, you know the network effect, which basically is you know the, the bigger the network is, the uh, you know the the more value it has. Um, and so just to paraphrase what that's about, I think that drives the uh, the backdrop for consolidation. Uh, and I think you know 5G and densification and IoT is going to set bring in a whole set of new players uh, that may add um, you know different aspects to that, which uh, will be you know, at the end of the day consolidated by someone like a Zayo, uh, for example. You know, just think about what's going to be happening in those edge data centers and the specialized uh, services uh, software that's gonna, that's going to be there. Uh, so cause it, I think it's just it's just going to keep broadening out, and I think 5G is really going to push a, a, you know yet another wave of consolidation once 5g uh comes into a full effect in the marketplace great well thanks for, for all that great perspective I think it's about out of time but uh thanks to my three speakers ray and mark cliff and uh thanks to jsa for the great opportunity to uh i'll hand it back to you Brady, and for wrapping. You're on your Sean. And, and yes thank you again our all-star panelists cliff king co-ceo of clarion networks mark surjack Vice President of Dark Fiber Services, Zayo, and Ray Lachance, of course, CEO of ZenFi Networks. And of course, thank you, Sean, our guest moderator, and the noted authority on dark fiber news in our industry. This wraps up our latest virtual CEO roundtable. Thanks for joining us. And please come and meet us in person, June 19th through the 20th, Telecom Exchange in Hoboken, New Jersey, where I have to mention, Cliff and Ray will be back at it again. Another CEO roundtable for you. <laughs> necessary infrastructure for wireless next-gen services so come and see them also uh, if west coast is your uh, interest join us november 6th to the 7th telecom exchange in la to feature your c-level here next time email us at pr at jsa.net and thanks for tuning in to jsa tv the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals and jsa radio your voice for tech and telecom on iHeartRadio. radio until next time happy networking Thank you.